So with your permission, uh, may I uh, invite uh, Dr. Sujata and Mr. Harshwander and Dr. Harshwander on to the stage. I have to correct myself to this also. I let me congratulate my Professor Harshwander who has now become a doctor. <laughs> Right. So, uh, you know the format we deliberately kept in half and half. Uh, it is we're doing this physically, but we are also broadcasting this on Zoom, and, um, and and some people have logged in there. Uh, the idea today is to have a conversation with all of you. Both online and offline, and I must thank everybody who's there on Zoom for waiting patiently for so long. We've had several problems over the last half an hour, but thankfully, all of them are solved. Yes, yes. Um, the, those of us who are here, uh, both online and offline, are extremely fortunate because we are attending the first international launch of this book. It's just come out, it's actually fresh off the press. Uh, and it's one of the most important uh, chronicles of contemporary history, and you will see a lot of what has been written in that over the next hour or so. Uh, I, I welcome you the third, the fourth participant who has been speaking here. Um, if she was, uh, she was a professor, Monisha Sikhi. Thank you so much for joining us, Monisha. Uh, I know it's very difficult for you, also because uh, I gave Manisha in fact 26 hours to read the book. And like a good student, she's there, ready to make her notes. And she's there in the other end of the camera. And please, she's not able to speak. So, right now, we will enable her with a little while. The format for this uh, presentation is going to be that I'm going to request uh, Dr. Harshwander to tell us about the book. He will speak for about, about half hour. Um, and, 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 and due to that, uh, we'll be asking him to reflect on his point. I will be leading that uh, conversation as we speak. Then we get Sujata uh, uh, to release the book, speak on it for a while. And then I'll get to Manisha Sikhi to join me. Manisha, if you've heard all that and understood it, is that okay? I, I, I have been receiving it's okay because you can't answer. So, we can, uh, so I will now request uh, uh, Dr. Harshwander to tell us about you uh, broadly, why do you what is what is it for us? Um, and, and then we can get on to, uh, to discussing some of the some of the more intricate nuances that got it. So, so just a broad introduction. The first question may be why do you write this? Uh, that message is important. Thank you, thank you, Amir. Uh, thank you, Asdan. And uh, thank you, all of you. Thank you, Sapa. And thank you, all of you who gathered here uh, in person and uh, online. Uh, I've written many books, and I think. This book became imperative uh, soon after the lockdown because of the intensity of the explosion of human suffering uh, that uh, occurred uh, in, in the nature of the response of the Indian state uh, to this century worst pandemic. I work with homeless people uh, and, uh, and uh, when the Prime Minister announced the lockdown, I was, I was amazed. You know, I was just listening to him. He was basically saying, uh, all, what you all have to do is to stay at home, work from home, uh, Keep social distance, wash your hands, take a jelly. 
And I said, he's our prime minister. Has he forgotten that in the cities, there are significant numbers of people who have no homes? The majority of the population in our cities, Bombay, uh, the Tharbi is supposed to be one of the densest places in the world. Um, they live, you know, 10 people to a shanty of 8 by 8 or 10 by 10. 150 people share a toilet. What is the possibility of them ever uh, uh, being able to keep any kind of social distance? Um, he's telling us that, you know, work from home, has he forgotten that 9 out of 10 workers in this country are in the informal sector? They earn every day and, and the families eat what they can earn that day. From the day they stop earning, there will be no food and there will be no work. Um, and then he said, everyone should wash their hands. Does he, does he not know that we have vast populations who have no, drink, no running water? I mean, if you look in any slum, uh, the tanker comes in and sells water, they buy one little plastic pot of water, which often costs more than, you know, it's about a quarter of their day's earnings is to buy that little water. Where are they going to be regularly washing their hands? And so it was quite clear that he was talking to people like you in the audience and me, who have homes, who have running water, who have the assurance, have savings in the bank, who have assurance that uh, if we stay at home, our employers would pay us. We have uh, He was not speaking to the large majority of Indians uh, who live in conditions of great distress. Uh, we all also have health insurance and so on and so forth. Uh, in the end of, and why did I write the book? So, uh, so almost from the second or third day. I could not, you know, I, I couldn't bear the idea of what would be happening to my homeless brothers and sisters. And I'm, I'm very pleased and touched that many of my young colleagues who worked with them felt the same way. And we decided that we would be on the streets come what may, and we would do what we can to feed as many people as an act of solidarity. Uh, I remember asking one of my young colleagues, uh, are you not frightened that you'll get corona? And he said, Harshi, I am frightened. But much greater than my fear is their hunger. That is why I have to be on the streets. And they were totally heroic. Uh, and then we had not planned, this is not what we set out to do. Uh, we have started the Karwani Mohabbat a few years ago reaching out to people affected by lynching and hate violence. But that became a collective of really very good and kind people. And so from Jharkhand, from Assam, from Osla Karnataka, from uh, UP, from Mewat, we started getting desperate calls saying the same hunger. And people started reaching out to us and saying, we want to give you money. So there was some, there's a keto is, uh, you know, one, uh, uh, what's it called? Platform, where the crowdsourcing platform, which is international. So some uh, Indian NRIs said that, can we do a fundraising for you? And and uh, we were not expecting, they were not expecting. In three days, Keto broke all its records from its founding uh, for the amount of donations that people gave and they continue to give. And uh, as I said, we hadn't set out, we had no, and this, the lockdown was there. Uh, people donated eight crore rupees. Uh, we distributed finally 10 million meals uh, around the country. It, is, it was still a drop in the ocean. But being on the streets, uh, I also found that the stories needed to be told. So uh, I, I had this young colleague called Sandeep, 
and he used to come along and I became the reporter and uh, I would speak about what I was seeing. Uh, he would record it. Uh, Karma would make the films. Some of these films got a million hits. People started, you know, so the, we, we wanted that people should not forget. And then, of course, the migrant crisis happened and people started saying, but where, you know, where have all these people come from? And it is amazing to me because our lives in the middle class, I mean, from before we open our eyes, it is these migrants who make our life possible. I mean, they are the ones who deliver the newspaper, the milk, they uh, cook the food in our houses, they clean and sweep our floors, they uh, drive us to uh, uh, work and, and so on, and right through the day. But we looked at them always as instruments that exist for our comfort, but not as, as full people. And suddenly, the state abandoned them. The employers abandoned them. And we have, and I, I'd like to just underline, this is the biggest overnight lockdown of, of an economy and of people that has happened in human history, is what India did. Even China, which invented the lockdown, at its peak lockdown, just 5%. We locked down 100%. We had, on the other hand, one of the smallest relief packages in the world. In, in actual transfers to the poor is less than 1% of GDP. Even wealthy industrialized capitalist countries have done 5, 10, Japan has done 20%. We calculated Prabhat Bhattak, Noiti, Koshanai, a couple of pieces. We calculated that. Just like the middle class was getting assured of getting their salaries at home. Since the government had imposed this lockdown, it should give minimum wages to all people. That would be about 6,000 rupees per family. And we said uh, the green entitlements double it and give it to them. We, we have it. All of this, my friends, would have cost only 3% of the GDP. And all of this distress could have been avoided. And the people, uh, you know, uh, and the economy, the crisis in it now, people would have had money, they would have spent it, etc. But so we had the most cruel, the most, the largest, the most cruel, uh, the most comprehensive, most mindless lockdown. And in the book, I've also talked about scientists, even within the government, uh, did not. In fact, Sujata was part of the first discussion that we had online and. She was saying there's so many committees, the epidemiologists, none of them, and they've chosen some pediatrician to lead this whole process. Uh, and there was, I mean, there's the evidence now that from the beginning, people had warned that this was, and, you know, I just to, just to be even more unpopular uh, with many people than I am, uh, let me really give the example of, of Pakistan. I mean, it's, in, it's, it's really telling. Pakistan, uh, you know, performance both with economic slowdown uh, and uh, in control of COVID is, is much better than India. And it's not a greatly run, governed country by any standards. All that happened was that Imran Khan, whom we rightly dismiss as this playboy elite uh, guy, when he was told that you should do a lockdown, he said, if we were an industrialist country where workers were mostly in the organized mm -hmm. workforce. And uh, if you know they all had social security and they had homes, then we could have. And the words he used actually are very touching and important for me. He said, what will happen to my people if you have a lockdown? How will they eat? How will, when they cut, how will they work? What will happen to them, to my people? And he refused to enforce a lockdown. And today, scientists, economists say, China, Pakistan, the people have a say because they did nothing. It's really extraordinary. The economy is in much better shape. Bangladesh was in much better shape than us. So we did this more, we imposed so much suffering. There was an explosion of hunger. 
in my the first chapter of my book is basically talks about just what we heard uh, you know in, in terms of hunger uh many people uh, from the time start saying that hum corona se to marne wale nahi hain bhook se mare hain you know and i the many memories i remember this guy he was you know we were standing in line and suddenly he, he he broke out in rage he said and they keep referring to modi modi ji kehte hain ki hum ghar mein rahe hain ghar mein rahenge to kya hum divar tod ke usko khayenge you know this is what he said and by the time he reached and one little uh, thing he was shaking you know uh, with the i have as a district officer i've seen moments of some of this kind of hunger at the worst periods of drought in in fact i have never seen it in the city and i worked for the last 20 years very intensely with the homeless if suddenly through uh and it started off with people like the homeless but very it was informal kind of distress calls so everyone started ringing up a few of our numbers then we systematized it and we found that we were getting calls from unexpected places which should have not been unexpected we found industrial workers uh large parts of delhi are where factory workers live but most of these factories are you know five people ten people you know uh these kinds of establishments uh, not they not much richer than the people who, uh, who who work with them all of them became unemployed overnight their factory owners said we have no capacity their landlords said the landlords are just like them they are just a little better off we live on on the rent that you give how can we manage and and these people you know who had never imagine that one day they would be and they would be standing and we would distribute food and there would be a line one kilo within like this seconds people would gather one person said to us modi ji kehte hain modi ji said that if we get into crowds we will die he must be wanting us to die because i mean this is what he said because this is how they giving us food we have to they they would have to like uh, 10000 people 20000 people bodies pressed against each other pushing each other to get the you know get, to get one meal uh so he actually said he said he obviously wants us to die because uh, and then modi ji instructs us that please come out to your balconies and you know celebrate this again he was talking to people who had houses with balconies who very obediently came and celebrated didn't they think for a moment about what was happening to the poor by then the migrants were on the streets so before you move away from this topic because this is really important for all of us here you know uh, i'll be constantly plugging the book because one because it's a it's a fabulous book and secondly because it's fresh in my mind i just read it last night um one of the one of the most remarkable aspects of this book is the fact that it has the best quantitative analysis that you can look at all the numbers given all the sources extremely credible and then just as you're getting overwhelmed by your numbers come these real life stories that validate what the what the literature is saying and and paint it in such vivid detail that you actually understand what's going on so that's the beauty about this was great for the academic researcher and great for the rest of us who want to understand what went on and in that there is the hunger part which which harsh uh, mandar i call him sir because he taught me uh, 25 years so and uh, in the academy and uh, and has been sir for ever um, so uh, you know the fact is that that in this when he talks about the hunger thing that's been his is is important subject for so long he's he's dealt with hunger dealt with homeless people you will see that running strain through his through all his books um and and the beauty is that here is one person who understands all that so well the policy aspect the administrative aspect the theoretical aspect and has gone out there and actually fed people by holding them now so 
how does it matter if you are feeding, you know, we fed uh, 10,000 people, Amjad fed, Javed Bhai fed a few people, in 160 million, does it matter? Should we be doing it? See, I, I believe very strongly uh, this was not a response of charity, it was a response of solidarity. If your brother and sister was left jobless and hungry, what would you do? That was the question for us. And so I would reach out to the capacity, we know that the 100 million, uh, the 10 million meals we distributed was less than a drop in the ocean. But it was necessary to do as an act of solidarity, to say and to do it with respect and to do it with care. And then because I write, I also, and you know, I began to understand many things about the experience, the shame of, you know, having to stand you know, the whole day, the ones who were not able to escape had to spend their whole day. They wake up in the morning, the line would start. You'd sit waiting in a line for two hours, three hours in the hot sun, and you'd get one plop of khichdi. You go home in about a couple of hours. Again, you sit in the line, stretching, and 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 the shame of uh, you know. And I've seen people, you know, this lady came in one place. I, I was walking past and she was cooking something on, you know, some bricks and a little chula outside her to keep. And she covered it up with something. So, uh, so I said, you know, I just looked at her and she said, I'm feeling ashamed. Uh, so I said, why are you feeling ashamed? And then she took off the thing and, you know, the, the feet of the chicken, which is normally thrown away, she was cooking that. And she said, I'm ashamed because I'm reduced to a situation where this is the only food I can give to my children. And I sat with her and I said, you should not be ashamed. Uh, you should be extremely proud of yourself. Uh, that in these hard circumstances also you're not letting your children sleep hungry. If anyone should be ashamed, it is the government which has brought you to this situation. Then this other lady was talking and she said, I want to say something you know, uh, to the camera and she was looking okay. And, and then she said, Hum kitne aap She said, Ek khabar aai, ke ek school mein aaj koi khana Hum log sab Line bahut lambi the. Jab hamari baari aaye, tab tak sara khana khatam hogi. Aur do kere de ke apne हमारा चूल्हा कई दिनों तक जला ही नहीं है मेरे घर में। What are we doing to our people? What was the point? And nobody seemed to care. And at the peak of the hunger, we see our prime minister dressed in very, you know, seven different changes of clothes, giving food to peacocks uh, in his garden. I mean, the absolute absence of any kind of compassion uh, stuns me. But the second thing is, is, you know, Amir, is that why was the lockdown justified? If there was any justification for the lockdown, uh, people were saying that we need a little time period to prepare our public health systems for this great onslaught that is coming upon us. Now, what did they do then? India's healthcare system, and Sujata Ji would know much better than that, Hope she'll speak about it when, when she does. 80% of our trained health personnel today work for the private sector, work for for profit healthcare. Their contribution to the COVID crisis is less than 10%, it's estimated. And I think it's a very generous estimate. It's for when Amit Shah and uh, you know, various chief ministers need to get admitted, our, our health minister in Delhi, then they can pick themselves. It's at huge costs and, 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 and so on. Now, so it was left to 20% of the health force to look after the century's biggest uh, health calamity. Large part of that 20% also refused. Oh, I'm an ENT, I'm about 60, I'm doing something else. I found in the public hospital that I got admitted into that doctors who wanted to come were also not permitted. Uh, most of the people in the COVID ward 
वो completely untrained because even the board board boys and nurses were not willing to come. I was speaking to to the board boys and just about that. I like to talk. I was there admitted in one of the general boards uh, at some stage and he said. मैं कलॉट प्लेस के होटल में रूम बॉय था लॉकडाउन के बाद वो होटल बंद हो गया माय फैमिली स्टार्विंग सो द गवर्नमेंट सेड एनीवन वाज विलिंग टू वर्क इन द कोविड वर्ल्ड कैन कम विल टेक यू योर जॉब सो वेयरिंग ऑल दैट पीपी नॉट नोइंग अ थिंग अबाउट व्हाट ही सपोज टू डू दिस दिस यंग मैन माय होमलेस ब्रदर एंड सिस्टर्स वुड टेल मी दैट these kinds of stories what what i saw people even much worse they would say that no one was willing they if not give medicine they throw it at you like that and uh, uh you would be uh, you know lying somebody dies next to your bed there somebody dead no one is willing to pick up the body so you're sleeping amidst corpses and you make some noise about it so they say if you're so concerned you pick up the corpse and take it to the mortuary we are not prepared to touch it so the patients then gather together and start picking up the corpses and and, and taking it what have we brought ourselves to the government said it is the prime minister announced and and we never had a prime minister whom you can trust less so what he says should have the weight of uh, you know true and we, we should be able to trust he said we get treated one like New beds for COVID. Not true. They de-purposed uh, one like beds. So if you're cancer patients, if you're TB patients, if you're anything, they would say, "Now, no, none of this." So um, uh, 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 in Bangalore, I mean, in Bombay, this is, this is no less than Bombay. Cancer patients, serious cancer patients, were turned out of their ward. and under the under the flyover they put maps and these patients were made to lie on maps these are cancer patients who and uh, and that is how we created those one like beds where so i'm saying to left to the 20% of that 20% large part of it abdicated so 3 4 5% to be committed no, you can't re- repair the neglect of uh, a generation overnight what could they have done they could have at least spain nationalized its private health care for the period of the epidemic i mean we were still debating i'm mean, to get a test done they said never it actually cost nothing more than about 200 250 rupees uh, they charging 2000 rupees 2500 rupees that was one progressive order that the supreme court passed that you no know, test prices should be seen and then inexplicably or very explicably in 3 4 days that order also they revised and allowed them to charge what they feel like so what are we running I and mean, who is there to take care of the poor and the uh, you know the, the, the extraordinary thing about this virus is that it first hit the rich and it first hit white people in industrialized nations that's why the the world grew to this panic in this same period 15 times more i think people died of tb than have died of covid in this same period who cares will be bring our economies down to uh, a halt to stop the advance of tb it was because rich and middle class people and when the prime minister said all of this we thought we are being protected so we are very happy and we don't care uh, people tell us that if you know trains have a capacity daily we were carrying 23 million people and the number of migrants who even at the highest estimate worked was about 30 million which makes it the largest movement of in distress of human populations even than partition the only greater movement of human populations in distress was the slave trade in from africa to the americas 
if they had just run the train for the migrants free full capacity for 10 days 15 days when there were just 500 reported cases across the country think of what would have happened if they then given people this 6000 rupees a day when people would not have had to go those who wanted to go would have gone with dignity and safety very few of them carrying any infection to them so the lack of compassion and, and, and instead we kept them and they could even go out to work so in these crowded uh, you know uh, slums and shanties these became like hot houses for the super super breeding of the virus the virus if it loves anything it loves closely packed human bodies and so by forcing them to stay here we actually made them you know what they call uh, quarantine centers which they opened in the beginning. in schools they just packed uh, poor people in you know in tiny spaces you have huge numbers of people so they were just creating i mean it not only caused so much distress and this mindless explosion of anger and dopelessness i mean joyti ko should say have you never heard you you suddenly overnight closed down all demand and all supply and who does that and if you did it if you were actually then everybody was concerned about not buying and selling mlas and you know toppling governments but actually that people should have then they, if they had shown that they had done a lot during this period but actually none of that and that total confusion testing is at the core they didn't increase you know our, our testing levels are still among the lowest because we want to manage the optics our numbers are actually much much higher because we're testing so much and it's more important that we somehow manage the optics so up to now there was still some noise because even in the middle class we were suffering but it hadn't reached the very poor to date it's reached the very poor and i can say and uh, invisibly they are dying they getting covid no one is going to give them any kind of we don't have we haven't created any public health system over the last generation i as the son of an ias officer i remember i used to only go to a cghs dispense when i was i used to sit in, on a bench outside like everybody else no one would have dreamt of going to a private uh, private clinic and because we went there that it, the quality was all right as a district collector i felt morally i had no right to go to private health care and i, I had all kinds of experiences um, my, my tooth had to be pulled out and uh, and and i said no i would only go to and i went there and i found this thing it was covered with dust and it was so dirty the dentist was really nervous and then he started praying before he put something into my mouth and i got even more anxious at the what is going then he pulled and pulled and portions of my gum started coming out uh, my jaw got locked for 15 days uh, in pain i just couldn't move that was but i was responsible for that public hospital and if it was in that bad shape uh, you know at least i should then but i must live with its consequences just a second uh, at this point some people don't change people or some people don't change here is a person who goes through that gets his uh, non lockdown because a little tooth has to be changed and then repeats the whole thing he goes and gets admitted into one of the lousiest uh, wards to get treated of covid and comes close to death like they kill him there i mean there is i'm not exaggerating uh, last 20 days harshpandar is born again literally physically he goes there and gets admitted to that same ward in a, a public hospital which none of you have even seen one of the fine the finest book on this which you know i i kept getting reminded of because sir kept talking about care is title to be care india's health system the author is sitting to the far right it is the it is the it is, it is a book that all of you have to read if you want to understand india's health system i it's my 
I teach a course and I, that's why I start reading. I think that's a great book to read. So uh, Salim and I were writing a lot on, uh, on this issue and we were talking about that particular uh, point that you made on testing. You know, uh, that it cannot be that you can charge anything more than 300 rupees. And here people were talking about four and a half thousand as if it was a it was a you know dole that they were giving, and that resulted in some of the least uh, testing uh, numbers. But so the, the question so, South Korea had had testing at anyone could go at the metro station at the bus station. They had no lockdown, and because they tested, tested, tested. And as soon as they tested, then they found the contacts. And they, they showed how you could do this. Vietnam, which is a much poorer country than us, has gone to almost zero levels of infection by testing. But most of all, by I think by elementary compassion. You know, uh, we have demonstrated a society of middle class and rich people and a state, which I think above all just doesn't care. So this brings me to what I think, you know, this because of my profession, the chapter on public health is really the most brilliant chapter. And for anyone who wants to understand what the status of uh, health system is, uh, please, you know, you find that really, really neat. But the chapter that a lot of you uh, will read with, uh, with great interest and shock and awe um, is this chapter on... Uh, who was responsible? You know, there is this really great chapter that says that suddenly the responsibility of COVID was the Muslim. It were these Muslims that were spreading these things. It became a tabligh. That chapter is a very telling chapter. It and then in another chapter uh, there is this there is this really heartbreaking story that. Uh, that sir recounts and it's just for that story that we should read this book. But I will ask him to tell us a little bit about that. Say, where did the Muslims come in and what happened? No, it's, it's again, the capacity of this government to actually accomplish its, its, its objectives. You're having this century biggest pandemic. We have a countrywide lockdown. Uh, you know, which uh, which no one has ever done in human history, and no one did even in, 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 in currently. You had the devastation of of of, of what migrants, the explosion of hunger, and so on. In the midst of it, instead of dealing with this, within a week, the story suddenly became that all of this is happening because of Muslims, and the fact that see the Tablighi Jamaat perhaps was an unwise decision. But please remember that from the Prime Minister Dublin, everyone said there's no crisis, there's no crisis. Parliament was in session at that time. The MP government fell because MLAs were being bought and sold at that time. Religious gatherings of various religions, including to the one into which I'm born in Nandir, were happening at that time. And the Tabliki Jamaat was also happening at that time. So, uh, and they had come with permissions. The government had allowed them to gather. Now, suddenly, you, you know, it just every single day, there was in the government's own, central government's reporting, sadly, even the Delhi government's reporting. Markaz ke karan itna hua, ye hua, the PK Jamaat ka ye hua. You know, statisticians say that if you, if you had done this with any other group, Suppose you've done it with the Tirupati group or the Nandir group or any other group. Because then you actually went and found all their contacts and you did found all their contacts and you tested. You obviously would find huge numbers. But what they presented it as if this was unique to the Muslim community. Now, why did the Muslims, why were the Muslims actually choose to become in a sense super spreaders according to the scenario? The milder version was that they are just so digitally bigoted that you tell them don't go to mosques and they'll all gather at mosques. Uh, you tell them this thing. So uh, because of this bigotry, they're not obeying any and therefore it is spreading. But they actually spread and through a whole media campaign, 
that they actually, this is another jihad that they are doing. And they want to, want to kill other Indians so that they become the majority in this country by spitting into vegetables and spitting into other stuff that you buy. Now, if this was not so absurd, uh, you, you just look at it. That, that the majority of ordinary, I mean, I met so many working class Indians who wouldn't normally be communal, who were convinced about this. And they would, uh, you know, treat, so you had Thelawalas in, in, in upper class, middle class, RWAs, they wouldn't allow a Muslim to come and sell vegetables. Uh, they asked you to put a saffron flag on your uh, vegetable to prove that you were a Hindu who was selling so that it's safe to buy from you. I mean, to me, it's a spectacular. And while they should have been actually working and creating all those beds for us and to treat us, this was the campaign that was, that was going on. And they succeeded in... And, and then after they had completed the whole quarantine period, they just wouldn't release them. They put them in jails, they spent months in jails. Very recently, about a few days ago, foreigners have been kept in jail for, for no reason whatsoever. They come here legally uh, for a religious gathering. Uh, and uh, it, the Tabliki Jamaat is an interesting, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it goes against most of my beliefs. But basically what they're trying to do is they're not trying to convert anybody, incidentally. They're trying to say you have to go back to the fundamentals of your faith. And uh, Sayyid, uh, Sayyid Nakhvi uh, jokingly wrote is that they have a great, uh, they don't like, if they see people cheerful and enjoying, they get very panicky. Because, uh, so, so there are many ways that I mean, you can criticize the Tabriq Jamaat for, for many reasons. But this gathering was just, just a gathering that, and people had come from it. We released them from jail. Uh, a few days ago, the foreigners were going back. And I was reading, again, I, I got tears in my eyes. They were speaking without bitterness. They were still talking about, that we love this country. We hope we can come back here. Sometime back, uh, you know, one foreigner was released uh, from one of the African countries. And with all that happened to him and all that he suffered, he remembered that the, there was a jail staff was worried about him uh, during the rosas and used to bring him dates quietly and give it to him. And that is what he's taking back with him. He chooses to take that back with him. But, but why did we lock up people for, for a year for being part of a religious gathering that was happening all across? But, you know, this, I mean, just, uh, just pull, pull on and I think maybe there's a story that I have. The last chapter of my book is called uh, A Movement for Civilization and Introspection. And I start off with a story in Defense Colony in the upmarket, uh, Defense Colony of Delhi, where sadly, you know, right early on, uh, the two old young parents, uh, you know, have COVID, they're in hospital, they're struggling for their lives. Their son, who is a little younger, is also in hospital struggling for his life on a bench. Tragically, uh, the grandfather passes away. He dies. The grandmother and uh, and the son, after great difficulty, uh, get cured and come back. In the middle of all of this, somebody in the family thinks it fit to complain to the police that, you know, we have this security guard. He's Muslim. And they had no business to call him to do errands you know, at the PM. So nobody's asked him. So he used to come and do errands for us. He secretly must have gone to the Tabriki Jamaat uh, gathering and he would have brought this infection to us and therefore he should be arrested. The police diligently files a complaint and FIR against him. He in terror sort of tries to hide. He becomes a fugitive. And then he gets, they find him quite quickly and they arrest him. And they test him and he tests negative. And he says, I never went to the Tabriki Dama. I knew she, knew she had, but he was negative. Then it turns out that their grandson used to study abroad. And he came back recently. 
And so the obvious person who would have carried it was not. But this guy, because he was a Muslim and he was poor, uh, was and the police registered a case against him, arrested him, uh, and there was it was all over Shilly in our newspapers. The RW issued, be careful of it's the domestic helpers who should have been careful of us. We were not, not to be careful about them. The story didn't end there. Two, three weeks later, I read another story. And then that story is that the same family then employs a domestic help who's 18 years old from Jharkhand. So she comes in and they say, but firstly, we'll have to get her tested. So they get her tested uh, with RT-PCR test. It used to take three or four days. Sadly, at about 10 o'clock at night, the results come. And they say she's positive. So what the family does, same family, they turn her out at 10 o'clock at night in the midst of the full curfew and so on. Now this 18 year old village girl is standing in the middle of defense colony, the roads are bare and she's wailing away. What is, what, where am I going to go? What's going to happen to me? And then a few security guards, happily a few people from the middle class from some of the homes came out. They found she had a brother, they managed to get the brother, and sometime late at night. I mean, so I start off and I say that Arunati Roy, somewhere in a discussion with us, she said, she put it very beautifully. She said, COVID 19 is a virus, but it's also an X ray. It's an X ray which demonstrates, it's an X ray of, X -ray of our society. And it has revealed to us what kind of people we are. And I say it has revealed to us as a people who are so uncaring as a middle class. You know, uh, Ravi Shivasta, who works with labor all his life, he, he, I was talking about you know, how you know various labor laws and everything was broken, etc. said all of that is is still less. Something else broke during those three months, and that was trust. Even our poorest people with no labor protections had felt that when we are really in trouble, the government will help us and our employers will help us. And what we demonstrated to them is that if a crisis comes, we are going to throw you to the wolves. We have revealed ourselves uh, in this way. And I thought that at least now they would say, Let's at least have some social protection. That law which hasn't been passed for, for decades, let's do that. Instead, starting with Mr. Aditya Nath and various other chief ministers, they said, to thoda about your protection we have for labor, let's dismantle those also. Now, I mean, that's how we have tried to respond to this. Uh, so, uh, on the other hand, I, I also talk about circles of kindness. I mean, not just my own young colleagues. I used to be touched at the number of just ordinary people who were on the streets. You know, when the migrants were walking, we'd have you know, people coming in and, and, and the police used to just allow us all. I mean, Rampas had permissions, but they saw food, they saw water. They would... I found car after car would come of, of middle class people. They stop the car and give water pouches, food, empty out their car and drive away. Uh, that also happened. I was talking to some person in Nizamuddin, I remember he was a homeless person. And there were other homeless people. And I was just chatting, talking with him. He said, actually, I had a little bit of a savings. I, I, as much as you have. And I've spent it on food. But he said, I, but it was not just food for me. I am alone. But this family is here. They sleep next to me. And they're small children. How could I have eaten and not fed them? So those small savings he spent on food for, you know, kindnesses. I found far more kindness in the poorest. I used to find, you know, like this little tailor was full of, some 500 meals in these little packets. So I said, 
so the, the guy told me that a chota sa tent house hai he feels very badly that people are hungry so every morning they all gather they, they cook this food and then in this little thela they go travel around he distributes nobody knows who he is what he is we are still together because of those circles of kindness yeah. so but others uh, 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 really remarkable is and you have to tell us that that story about that cycle that's yeah. all inside yeah. that's that's a lovely story actually uh uh yeah, among when this migration was going on there was this desperate worker migrant worker whose child was disabled and he had to get him home so what he does is that he steals a bicycle but before in when he when he steals his bicycle he writes a note to the owner of the bicycle saying i have done you a big wrong i'm sorry i took your cycle but i have this disabled son and i had to take him main aapka gunegar but i did and the guy who owns the bicycle was sweeping his veranda and found this paper and he read it and then he decided not to complain to the police that his bicycle was stolen that too is india but to and, and sir it is not incidental that the bicycle thief is some mohammad hanif and the fellow who doesn't register that if i are some satna singh yeah, yeah. so it is not in this curious in this strange days that's a important part of the story so to so, i mean i i know uh, take you back to this issue which you written about and which has become really critical today uh, and that is the issue of the labor laws you brought it in just now but i wanted a little focus on that you know uh, several of you here are people who hire other you will remember that india has had a pretty tough labor law system that's existed for about seven decades suddenly half way through the pandemic we just dismantled those laws overnight uh sir so talked about up up when up actually the mp government did it first the first thing that it did after it buys those mlas and comes to power um the next day it is the gujarat government the third day is the assam government and the fourth day is the up government what do they say that now onwards you will all be able to employ labor and make them work for 12 hours right W I N O X X R P D A P when they say eight hours and so on, you will allow. And that's what is happening right now. There are twelve hour shifts happening right now, and Assam brings in this thing about a uh, about a contract work that you can now legitimately give contracts to everybody, uh, which are time bound, even for regular work, which was it goes against the whole contract act that we read in. So, so what was it? I mean, what drives this move? And at this time. no i think you know uh, new liberals and market fundamentalists have said for a long time that we don't need the state to provide public services they are always terrible in any case and inefficient what we need is a free market even for public goods and if there's a free market it will create jobs in large numbers and people will have the money and then they will choose to buy the education they want the healthcare they want so the government should just and the transport it wants they should just step back and allow big business to flourish and that's in a very simplistic way uh, this has been the argument but the data from 2004 onwards which has been our big period from 2004 to 2010 uh, i might be slightly uh, wrong in the figures but the total number of jobs that were you no know, total number of new people that were added to our workforce was about 57 58 million the total number of jobs that were created through that period were about 2.5 million this is at the height of it and this is also misleading because most of the jobs that are now being created are, are uncertain unprotected low end employment so 
this the one justification for neoliberalism and the withdrawal of the state was that there would be an explosion of jobs the great dissatisfaction which led us to 2014 results a, a lot of it dealt with the fact that young people had nothing to look forward to and mr modi talked about creating uh, you know two crore jobs a year uh, among many other sort of falsehood and that did draw young people because they hoped that something would happen the job creation after 2014 has been even more drastic and so the government has found a very good option for them which is to stop publishing the data not to create jobs now with all of this background they said now the whole problem this migrant crisis happened because we have too much of labor protection so the little bit of labor protection that still survives let us dismantle that also so uh, capital will then come in they will invest and lots of jobs will be created everyone will be better off now when you have this evidence of two decades not just around here but around the world that new liberalism has not created jobs in fact uh, the last world bank report actually focused on you know actually admitted it in so many words and it had a very frightening uh, it had a very frightening prospect for the future this is the first time they are saying that we were lying and we were wrong all all along actually jobs are not going to happen they're going to get fewer and fewer this is the solution is let's just give a basic income to everybody now now now, now my worry is that as you said my my worry is that apart from you know whether it's feasible what is going to happen we don't exist we don't work only to earn a salary most of us we earn because it gives us meaning in our lives if our dream society is that most of us are going to sit at home and get a check every month and uh, not contribute to society not contribute to the economy if that is the india uh, or the world that we have dreaming of it's frightening and this is only when they, they now admit that actually we didn't we were creating those jobs for all this while and yet all these governments after the entire migrant distress now decides that you throw about the protection tha laws ka wo bhi hum dismantle kar thank you sir um before i before i uh, Hey, um, what we we'll do is a little ceremony. I will request Dr. Harshwantar to uh, to give a copy of the book to uh, to Sujata Rao. Um, sign, preferably, so that uh, yeah, and and we do a little release also because I don't want to keep uh, Sujata Rao for too long. As you can see, he just recovered from a surgery, so it's I I can't tell you how grateful I am. you can join this fight of this uh, so if i may so what you thank you <laughs> yes sir, i have my you give me <laughs> so um um sujata you know one of the one of the mischievous things that i did uh, some time ago was i'm taking a leap from 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 you uh, about do we care uh, i did one little exercise which was that 2013 when the current prime minister becomes appointed as the bjp's candidate to be prime minister and, astounded quite a few people including mr adwan um from then on he started speaking you know whatever else that people like us for the skeptics who don't love their prime minister say um he's a great speaker right he made some great speeches so so we collected books from that famous shri ram college speech to the to the first speech in parliament wembley all of that about 55 speeches So 85 hours of speech. You know, it's available in Word. Put it all in one document and hit search. Search for how many times does our prime minister 
use the word health? Any guesses with the answer? In 85 hours, it was once. And in that once, he inquires about Atal Bihari Vajpayee's health. <laughs> that, you know, but then credit to him that 2018 he talks a lot about a program that now we have forgotten, which is called Ayushman Bharat. But uh, I will now request uh, the author of most of the health uh, health system changes that we have seen. Uh, she herself admits that it is too little even now. But I have seen and several of us have seen the kind of zeal and enthusiasm that Sujata Rao brought to India's health systems. Um, I didn't want to tax her but we can't let you go without hearing you. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. This is not going to be a lecture on health. You come no, here. No, no, not the star all. is Nashanda. And I think he needs a clap. This is a remarkable, this is a remarkable compilation of his own experience. And of course, you know, I shouldn't talk so much about the book because they must read it. So, uh, uh, so please, yeah, I told you everything. Now that I have read, but I have quickly glanced through, there's much more. So, I strongly, strongly recommend that all of you pick up your book now and uh, read it and tell others. Largely because the one service that is uh, has done is, you know, Indians as a rule are very, very bad at documentation and listing out experiences. I mean, this book is as valid as if I were to write on for as a professional five years later. Just because I've written some, uh, uh, I guess, five articles and, you know, sat in Cambridge or something and written it, doesn't make it any less valuable than a uh, uh, immediate response uh, because this is the kind of information and uh, uh, documentation of memory as to what has happened. It's a real time uh, recording of events. The British were great documenting uh, people. They have left so many records, and because of that, uh, one professor from IAM has been able to document the India's experience of pandemic. In the period 1827 uh, to 1918, you know, cholera, plague, and uh, uh, and influenza. So, now this is something that's going to be invaluable if I were to write tomorrow a book on COVID. So, I think his, uh, uh, in all his activity, you all know Hachman Dutanan, he's a uh, real activist. He does more work in the street than in his library. So, for such a person to take time out and uh, you know conceptualize his uh, experiences and put it down in a book is not only valuable for people like me who sit and read only, but also for posterity because this is one of the resources that people will have to bank upon when they begin to understand what happened. So it's an invaluable service uh, that you have done and it's not a uh, mistake, but uh, very few books, in fact, I haven't, I'm still looking out for some more books and, uh, to come out on COVID. There's going to be many more coming, I'm sure, uh, in the months to come, because there will be a great interest, and there is a great interest to try and understand what happened and, uh, you know, where did we go wrong when we compare ourselves to our region and our neighborhood. Uh, but of course, you know, as a health person, I don't uh, blame anybody in that sense because it's a new virus, not many understand it. Is, uh, you know, but then there were a lot of mistakes as Harsha tried to uh, encapsulate that there could have been a much better way of dealing with the crisis. No one can help it if uh, 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 infection increase, but there's a manner in which the public health response should have come. We've seen it in Hyderabad also, how indifferent the government was, completely indifferent. So they won't do testing up testing, they are testing they are happy. So, you know, Telangana kept on denying that there was any COVID, which is not true. They never bothered about migrants. 
you know, bothered about uh, even in shrubs, you see different values and that. So when you have a very indifferent and a careless uh, uh, quality, then these pandemics, which already cause so much of distress, become even troublesome and much more uh, harmful. So um, I think, you know, we have to really begin to reflect upon uh, how we have reached such a state. And more importantly now, I think what is going to happen is that the health system, fortunately, health is going to become center focus now. Finally, uh, I hope so at least. Uh, but everyone, whether you are economist, a lawyer, a historian, sociologist, politician, today understand that health is important and it can really hurt you in, a, in the stomach. You know, it's not just something that you're talking about. Uh, somebody else's health, it can hurt you personally. So I just hope that health now becomes, gets into the uh, discourse of, of, in the public discourse and good policies come out. Um, this kind of privatization that this current government in Delhi is uh, quite obsessed about, I just hope that will fall. Uh, I saw in a tweet, there was one uh, officer of BP Cadre who was in BPI Hello. And today, he is, uh, yesterday, he tweeted saying it's the public sector which has done much more than the private sector. And he was a very ardent fan of uh, private sector teaching things in the PIO. So, you know, that kind of change of understanding between public and private and politicians are going to emerge. So, I'm just hoping that such books, I mean, I just hope that policymakers will be done and tell them all. Uh, that it will give them an, another dimension of how to look at disease. You know, disease is something that you just can't, it's not a question of medicine, drugs, and hospitals. You bet you can be a bacteria, and a bacteria is for IV. I is not a question of just putting a bed in an air conditioned room. You need trained personnel, you need equipment, you need so many. I think then it's not a question of oxygen, then I have oxygen cylinder for you. It's not a cycle pump thing, you just go on pumping air into pumping drum. It's not that easy to do ventilators and incubation and so on. So I hope that, uh, you know, much more research will come out of this you know, horrible experience that we have gone through and uh, public health systems will improve. That is what is giving me hope. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank we have done in, in uh, focusing on this lockdown and uh, uh, you know reflecting it as what are the offshoots of a public health response in a non-public health arena. It's not only a question of how many infections and how many people have died, but what is the impact it has had on day-to-day -day, uh, living and the lives of so many people who may not be infected but have been so badly affected. And uh, I don't know if you've written about children, but I think for us, the generation has lost its education, and that it hurts me the most, really. Not going to school for a whole year, we could have managed that better. I think the bureaucratic response and the political response to the question of young people losing out on the education and the, and the future was absolutely callous and apathetic. I mean, it is. Uh, I mean, I look forward to what your reflections are. And I think, um, in closing, I would like to say, Harsh, you must continue to document these experiences. This is not going to be over. COVID is not over. Even if the vaccine comes, it's a no pandemic of this magnitude has ever been over in a few months. Of course, science and technology has advanced so much that within the short period, we have a vaccine today. Uh, maybe in another six months, we will definitely have a very good vaccine. It will protect us, something that we didn't have 100 years ago. And we need to give that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that uh, license to uh, the advances of science and technology. But still, it's not possible to cover everyone. This COVID virus is there, it will continue to be there, it will mutate further. We all have to change and we have to learn to live with it. So, and it's the poorest people who are likely to be getting most badly affected with these kind of viral infections. 
So I think so. We have to do this for the next few years. Very massive. Thank you, award people, and uh, you are the liver life same manner. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. And I really look forward to reading this uh, uh, book with great interest, and I would like to try it in my heart. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, as you notice, I am a big fan of Sujata House. And, uh, you know, in the brief thing that you mentioned, so very important for all of us to realize that the children really got, got the wrong end of the day. <laughs> again, uh, again, we just spoke about online education, imagining that everybody has internet and has smartphones. Again, you never thought about the children who wouldn't have it. And, those children, and I've known families where they've sacrificed everything so that they can have one smartphone, then they have three children, and they have to divide it among themselves in a slum amidst all the noise. But large numbers are not able to do that. But please remember that those who got, have got pushed out of the education system because of this are very unlikely to return. In the digital divide, they're unlikely to return. They're going into child labor. They lose the opportunity to transform their lives. Uh, I mean, I uh, yeah. It's, uh, may I now uh, may I now use this opportunity to also get in the, the third discussant, um, Manisha Sethi, Professor Manisha Sethi from um, uh, the Jamia Millia University earlier. Now, thankfully, relocated to Hyderabad, um, is. On, is with us on the call. And uh, Sriam, how are we going to run it? Yeah. So, Manisha, I'm bringing you in now for your comments. We will be listening to you on the loudspeaker. Yes. Am I audible? Okay. No, but I don't know if I'm audible to the. To Amir and others. Amir, can you hear me? Can you speak, ma'am? Yeah, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Amir, shall I begin? Okay. Sure. Uh, that, what I what I also uh, say after uh, very clear instruction to one of you that you should read the book. The book is some copies of the book are available there. Salman in this green shirt will be selling them, and uh, the author is here for you to get them signed. Fact that 
the railways, which actually has a direct contribution of one and a half to three percent to the economy at the bottom strata of the society, have actually been dismembered, have been dis dis have been have been disintegrated literally by this government. And uh, in the name of so-called privatization and development, again, we are facing a, a different threat to our economic uh, sustainability as well as our survivability. What uh, do you think? Because they also it's, it's also directly related to every sector of the economy. Forget about agriculture itself, but healthcare, capability of people to move, taking out migratory amongst the people, allowing youngsters to interact with each other. Where do you think would we go in this? And what is your thinking on that? Uh, on the enablement and revival of the railways, which is a critical requirement at the moment. How do we enable that? Any uh, other, we collect a few, we'll collect a few questions. So one on the railways, uh, sir made a point about how if we had run the railways well, we would have just you know, transported all those 30 million. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello? Just your thoughts on the gender impact of this even from up close. We've all heard about the impact of the nutrition, losses, etc. Apart from that, gender gender impact of it. Well, thank you very much for coming to Hyderabad so, and giving your first public appearance to us. Um, I just wanted to ask you that you know we've spoken about Modi ji and how everybody. Uh, generally finds that his policies are not working. Of course, then he comes back with a thumping majority. But um, is the feeling true that he's put the onus and responsibility back on the citizen? Because all through his talks or his advice or his public uh, you know, uh, talks on television were, you do this. As in, you look after, you look. So it's come back to the common man to be able to you know, run this country more than the government that they've chosen with such a thumping majority. So I'd like both your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, whether it is labor or agriculture or whatever it is, uh, things are going in the, uh, in a very direction which really brings a lot of anxiety and concerns in uh, every sector of railways. Uh, you know, so many things. Uh, <clears throat> the FCI is now uh, asking Adani to store the drugs. So, you know, we are all talking about the the But then, how the citizens? Not as doctors, not as not professionals, but what do we do about those public health systems? Uh, you know, uh, how do where do we start? Because it's not just individuals uh, protesting here or there. We need to run some campaigns, and I must say, in uh, Hyderabad at least, the Muslim Samaj, the Muslim Samaj. I really want to underline this. The Muslim Samaj came in the large numbers and to do the kind of charity work, amazing. Uh, you know, it, if it was not for that so called civil society, but actually, you know, a very human response to uh, uh, suffering, we wouldn't have gone through this, uh, you know, the uh, thing. And today, actually, Telangana is supposed to be doing much better in uh, COVID uh, times. Anyway, I mean, I, I was just thinking, what can people like us, you know, who are completely outside the hospitals and the health sector, what can we do about uh, doing something about the public health system? Hello. Manisha, can you try now? Um, Amit, can you hear me now? Hi, can you hear?
Amir, I think uh, actually there's no need for a discussant. <laughs> Is this mic working? Can you speak something? Yeah. Can you hear me? Am I audible now? No. Uh, can can you speak? I'm just anything. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Am I audible now? Better. Can I speak up a bit louder? So, um, what we'll do, uh, Anisha, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So, Anisha, what, you, what we'll do is that uh, you just go ahead and continue speaking. We will record the record you and then play it back because live is not happening. So can you just um, yeah, ask Anisha to call on somebody's phone yeah, and record? Actually, there's no need for so it. You can do that, record her and then we can play it back. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we'll, now, we'll now take up those questions that uh, Sanjay, your question. Oh, you go ahead. Right? So we'll answer your questions last. Okay, friends, uh, thank you all for the patience of staying with, with us in this in this very important conversation. Uh, I don't intend to explain this. I really wish we could have heard Manisha, but I think that this is largely being recorded. It's the first launch. And uh, we'll include Manisha's comments in the recording, uh, which, 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 which will, will be there. Um, let me take up the questions, actually, I mean, uh, the gender impact, let me we start with that. Uh, people have talked about actually this pandemic being accompanied by shadow pandemics. I mean, there wasn't one pandemic, there were several pandemics. Uh, I've been talking about the pandemic of, of hunger, uh, you know, the explosion of. Uh, but several people have spoken about. Uh, pandemic of domestic violence, when uh, women in very unequal, uh, unsafe situations are locked in with their partners who are violent, abusive and uncaring for months, and they are frustrated because they have no work uh, and so on. Uh, we've seen it sadly even after riots, right? uh, consistently after wherever we've worked in Gujarat and uh, in fact, in Gujarat, my colleagues who have been working with the right victims for their legal justice have now converted themselves into a group which is working uh, for survivors of domestic violence in the same community. Uh, and, and that is a really sad uh, reality. Uh, there's something about masculinity uh, which I, you know, I, I, I find uh, men are so much the weaker gender uh, in that they're not able to cope with, uh, with, with, uh, with disaster, with calamities. They somehow uh, you know, feel everything is not now no longer in their control. And the only way they can do, respond to it is by asserting this aggressive, toxic masculinity. Whereas women, culturally, uh, I'm sure it's not, bio it's not a biological, but it's cultural. Uh, women feel extremely responsible for their families. And I found them through calamities. Women tend to become much stronger, uh, hold things together. And this is, I'm not generalizing from one or two. I mean, I've worked now in many capacities, right from 84 to, to now. So that's been extraordinary about how actually men break down psychologically, take to drugs, uh, have mental health issues, and beat up their wives and their children. Uh, and and women tend to become stronger and hold the families together in these places. Uh, there's also been a mental health shadow pandemic uh, again because you know the despair of losing your jobs, having no, not being able to feed your children, 
uh, and the violence of being locked up uh, with uh, violent uh, partners. So I think there's uh, and there's a lot more, but I, I just, on the railways question, I just want to very quickly say that uh, among all the sort of thoughtless decisions, suddenly to close down. Our railways carried 23 million people a day. <coughs> and suddenly overnight we decided that they'll stop. You know, among, uh, the first day when we were distributing food, I remember among many other people, there was this woman who came to us and she said that she was she's very poor, obviously, and she was traveling uh, from somewhere she had migrated with a little baby. She seemed to have been abandoned. And the train, and she was to go to Bihar, and the train suddenly stopped here. And she had no money and no food. And, uh, and she was saying, what, what do I do? You know, I mean, this. So, and we, we gave her food, and I said, how are you surviving so far? So she said, a very poor family in a joki near the railway station felt sorry for her. And so they took her in. And in the crisis of all of this, <coughs> sorry, they've been feeding her. Uh, we, we, we know the whole story about the government refusing to let people travel and then and the migrants and the reluctance and asking for money and then and the whole complicated procedures and how much suffering resulted. In that. I could not understand. If the simplest thing was that we will, you know, okay, we made all those mistakes earlier. We will gear ourselves and restore our entire railway system and for one month, all migrants can travel free to any part of the country on those streets. The, the, the railways would have got revived. The people would have uh, been able to get back to their homes without suffering. You know, the extraordinary, I mean, there are many extraordinary things, but you know, what I saw was that doing the humane thing would have also been actually the most intelligent thing to do from, from a very cold uh, uh, economic calculation. Because when I say both supply and demand uh, are cut down completely for the first time overnight, uh, demand means the, the capacity to buy, uh, and, and supply is the whole chain of, of production. Mm -hmm. Now, if people did get those 6,000 rupees every household across the country, which would just cost us 2% of the GDP, they would have sold it in local markets. They would have, you know, it would have had. A, a whole, we would just not have been in this. Uh, these are not matters of just carelessness. Uh, when uh, the Prime Minister actually, for the first time, we had front page when Geo was launched by the Alliance. We've never seen front page, and this is front page advertisements across the country in all newspapers, where we had the Prime Minister, his face on a private advertisement. Not by chance. What has happened since Geo was launched? MPNL and BSNL have provided excellent public sector services at very affordable costs in rural areas has completely collapsed. People have lost their jobs. Nobody even thinks of BSNL. Everybody has now gone into Geo. Now that you're addicted to Geo, now you're on your, in the trap. Now we'll raise all our prices. We'll do whatever. Uh, the, uh, the HCL could have produced uh, the Rafael instead it was given to Anil Lembani. Uh, they've entered into a contract. Stan Swami is in jail primarily because he opposed a project uh, where Adani is, you know, is first producing coal in Africa, uh, in Australia, which he is going to transport. And then he wanted land to produce, to set up a super thermal power project. In, what better than to displace tribal people? But normally, and normally, when you do it, at least the local area benefits because a significant percentage of the electricity produced has to be. They made an exception in this case, so 100% of of that electricity is actually going to be sold to Bangladesh at a price three times higher than what NTPC or a public sector would have been able to produce. Now, just start beginning to make calculations in your head about the levels of Tony capitalism and why Adani Ambani and Mr. Tata uh, love this government. 
and, and so there are two projects actually, the project of hate and the project of actually selling every resource. And the destruction of our railways, we're going back to Margaret Thatcher and what happened in the US after, I mean, UK, after all of the learning, you know, UK suffered a great deal. It had a beautiful public health system. It had a beautiful, but even now the public health system, whatever has survived of it, Dr. Robert Chambers, uh, very leading academic, he, uh, he lost his leg actually, he got amputated in this period. And he's been writing to me and he was saying that still it was the national health, health scheme uh, that still allowed us to survive uh, through this. We, we, we haven't built up public systems and those that work well, like the railways, we just destroyed, or like the SNL and so on and so forth. And, and none of us seem to be protesting. Um, what should we do as citizens uh, for the public health system? I think I, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a very important question. It's not just about why have we come to this point? Modi ji is not the problem. We have elected Mr. Modi and we continue to elect him and, and support him. Uh, Dime Magazine did this great story. I mean, it was one of, one of our favorite stories, uh, the cover story on the, on the migrant crisis. And what they did was they had this, you know, for, through several pages actually, they followed one Hindu migrant and all the suffering that he underwent. And in the end, he asked him, uh, uh, in the next election, who will you vote for? And he said, Modi. And uh, and it ends with, he did a long interview with me. And uh, so it, it, the article ends with that interview. He asked me, how do you explain this? How do you understand this? And I said that, as I understand it, Mr. Modi has is injecting uh, into the veins of our society a drug, you know, like heroin, but far more dangerous. And that drug is called hate. And us, us nashe me, intoxicated by that drug, uh, we are hum chhum rahe hain. And it's, it's brought us to a point that nothing matters. Hunger doesn't matter. Unemployment doesn't matter. Uh, you know, crony capitalism doesn't matter. Because hum to us nafret me chhum rahe hain. So what can we do as citizens? And I was having this conversation actually at uh, Zahid's, uh, his parents and so on last night. And, and I didn't think that many people who were gathered there were, were agreeing with me. I said, there are no simple fixes. This is a battle of hearts and minds. We saw one partition in the land of this country. We are seeing now a million partitions in our hearts and minds. It is there that we have to fight this. It starts with our own drawing rooms. It starts with our dining table conversation. It starts with the conversations we have with our friends, with WhatsApp groups. Uh, have we allowed hatred and prejudice to get colonized in our hearts? And I've said this earlier. Uh, I I recall my childhood. I was born eight months, eight years after freedom. It was still a very idealistic time, and. Uh, we are a partition family, uh, my extended family suffered enormously. We were from Rawalpindi. We heard all the stories, but I never heard, I do not recall in my entire childhood, hearing anything of prejudice from my parents. And when I was quite young, I actually told my parents, we have a prayer room with the Granth Sahib. And I said, you know, I feel much happier if you also have a and Allah and a cross. Uh, and, uh, and my mother, without hesitation, said, yes, of course. And to this date, that is what our prayer room looks like. Uh, I studied in an elite boarding school called Mayo College. I don't recall ever encountering uh, prejudice there. I, I studied in St. Stephen's. I don't recall. I mean, all we used to talk about was you know, how, how we make the world a better place. Etc. Etc. Today, my grandson is two, two and a half years old, and I watch him grow with so much uh, anguish because 
from the moment he's able to understand this world and he's already begun to understand he's only going to enjoy, uh, encounter bigotry valorized bigotry he's going to hear it in his extended family he's going to hear it in school he's going to hear it, watch it in social media he's going to watch it on television he's going to watch it in his films and he's going to watch it most of all in the conversation in the speeches of all our great leaders so uh, we elected we are electing mr modi we are electing uh, adityanath and amit shah we are electing people who are uh, ndtv did a, a tracking of hate speech what they call vip hate speech hate speech by people of authority they found a 700% increase since mr modi's come and that was 2 3 years ago now to be i think thousand i mean the delhi elections were just hate speech of the most toxic kind by the most senior people as a district elector all those people should you know including our prime minister and home minister by the law should be be spending many years of their life in jail just for the speeches that they made uh, so the normalization and the and, and you're a hero yes, so i call it the valorization of bigotry because you're not just it's not just accepted you you're saying what needed to be said and these all these left liberals etc uh, you know uh, are hiding uh, the true enemy uh, is, is what is being said so the answer uh, is in my mind and, and also some one of you talked about atma nirbhata the government is actually ek baar wo nasha aa gaya hai it is not done them feel responsible i mean when the prime minister says ha ha you all are going to lose your job so i appeal to the employers and to the landlords uh, not to uh, to pay you your wages through the lockdown and so it became and and not so are we to be asking 90% of our people to be dependent on charity and they had no system when it wasn't enforced and we had taken a petition to the supreme court and this was the answer that the government gave and the supreme court accepted it that we made this appeal now there's no system to enforce that appeal and it was almost never fulfilled but and you cannot ask your people to be dependent on chance charity so when hunger and the stories came so in one of the latest speeches i appeal to you to feed somebody or something as if you know it's again an act of charity and again he was talking only to us he wasn't talking to the large mass of indians who were living with that hunger what was he telling them they go and beg outside somebody's house and maybe you'll get some food and that's all that i can promise you so atmanirbhata to thi and and this is not something i mean so many migrants actually because the last great speech was in atmanirbhata he was saying yahi to hua hai hum sab atmanirbhar ho gaye hain we are now told that we just have to take care of ourselves uh you know the, the virus is come people are going to die we will not get a hospital we not get a lot of transport we not get our jobs the government will give us more relief so hum atman nirbhar hi hain and please remember that all of these people from up and bihar etc who are migrants these are largely remittance based economies what happened after the lockdown the, the families that were dependent on your monthly pay, paycheck became the people who had to beg for money to survive and they provided it and to travel and to and and to all of this now in in that situation you were no longer the provider you became uh, you know dependent again on the charity of of the poorest among your loved ones and what have what have we done to our society so i'll just end that it's been a very long conversation i'm sorry about that uh, what are the solutions the solution to my mind is only rebuilding our society on the foundation of of solidarity and there is i mean that's why i was saying when i was talking in zaid's house last night i found from the faces and body language very few of the men i spoke to seem convinced are ye to fir ab lambi mai keh raha hu ki inhone 100 saal tak wo lade hain hindu mahasabha was set up exactly 100 years ago and they reached this point because they He held on. I mean, when Gandhi was assassinated, 
the RSS became a completely, you know, in my childhood, I never heard that anyone would admit to being an RSS member. And, but they persisted and they persisted. And the kind of dedication they had, I had a riot when, when I was just a collector in a place called Kargon. And I, I, I recall that, you know, we, we, we were able to control it in a very short time. And my SP and I, for 19 days, I didn't go home and we just keep traveling night and day. We just speak for a couple of hours at the, at the police station. And everything became calm, but in one colony, they kept saying that at night, at 2.00 p.m., they would put stones in the mosque and, and you know, riots would break out. We went there, the mosque was really far away and through winding lanes, you know, how somebody could have thrown a stone from the mosque. We tried to joke with them. I said, we could have thrown a stone from the mosque and we could have thrown a stone from the mosque and we could have thrown a stone from the mosque. But people, once you want to believe, you'll believe. My SP was very competent. So one day when we just went on night after night, we thought we could have riots again. Uh, and the in the middle of it was one, a broken cup. So without giving anybody a chance, he took that cup, went into one of the houses. He knew what was happening. So he went to the first floor and there were five other cups and this was the sixth cup. He went one more store up and he found that there was this baksa tha jisne patthar And there was this dedicated old RSS Kaga man who at two o'clock at night used to get up and start throwing stones at people's windows. And as they wake up, he'd say, Dekho ye musulman, abhi bhi sudhne nahi hai, masjid se patthar prayen Now that's a dedication. That is dedication. Nobody is going to... Uh, we have no dedication for our love. And there's no shortcut to it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. You know, one of the other things about the book which we haven't talked about is that the chapter at the end then talks about what next. And how do we tackle it? And it also gives very considered, dispassionate, purely legitimate, rational uh, options that the state could have done and should be doing. So that's that's a very neat uh, ending to that that some of you will, uh, will find uh, very appealing because it does give a solution. It's not about problems. So the book really tells you the story of possibly the biggest tragedy that the world has ever seen. It tells you about the, the draconian nature of public policy in India, which does what some people sir, have called a demonetization too. That you decide, you decide that you have to do this, and there it is, the silver pill that will ta tackle every possible problem. Yeah, so the scientists, committees, now we have all their documents, all of them said this is disastrous, don't do it. Yeah, GST. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you know, uh, I, one of the little things that happened was a strange app called Arogya Setu. And now when you want to know who developed that app, the government doesn't know. Doesn't know where that app came from. Uh, doesn't know and admitted, in, in, was it in parliament or in court, that we don't know the number of migrants because we never counted them. So that seems to be the answer. But, you know, in this book, there is that analysis as to how things happened, why did it happen, what was the government response, why was it akin to a demonetization? You know, no uh, analysis done, nobody consulted. Uh, so we were writing again when we were writing those uh, articles that you know Paul's famous uh, slide where he said that 16th of May, because Modi ji has said it, uh, COVID will end. This is the most responsible, uh, you know, head of our uh, think tank. Who, uh, Niti Ayog's advisor on health, the big guy on health, right? Sujata was telling me, in fact, she was saying that we have so many, we have committees, the epidemiologists, none of them, all of them were advising against it. They took a pediatrician who had no experience in epidemiology, had no understanding. He became the chair, and then he mouthed whatever Mr. Modi would say, and he said, Ab 16 May tak hai, to 16 May se khatam ho jayega. Ek wo, sola this is Paul. Paul is like, you know, he's like, 
So he's saying it with authority, showing that, that decline. Then there was that famous thing which said that 15th August will be the vaccine. Right? So we have had a series of this is exactly demonetization. So so the book talks about that. You know, and on that economic issue, I think that the book raises a very, very serious issue. That this problem is not a problem of uh, the virus or of the vaccine, because everybody seems to believe that these series of vaccines and we will see the world coming back to its glory. It is this, we have never, we don't know, no economic model can ever explain to you what happens when an economy contracts. We, we know about a recession. We know that if growth rate falls from 7 to 6 percent, then what happens is that if the GDP growth rate falls by 1 percent, we lose 0.5 percent of jobs. Right? That's a lot of jobs. That in, in India's case, it is about 2 million jobs that you lose with a 0.5 percent reduction. It's not a contraction. So to give you numbers, if you were earning 100 rupees last year and you earned 106 rupees this year, you have a 6 percent growth rate. Next year, if you earn 111, then you have grown by 5 percent roughly. So your growth rate has gone lesser because of which jobs will be lost. This year, what we have seen is your salary go from 100 to 76. We don't know what happens with that. We've never seen this situation in the world. With, with record high unemployment, last year's unemployment rate, this is pre-COVID, um, unemployment rates were close to 19% and 32% for the educated urban worker. 32%. You can imagine what's happened now. So this book really talks about what, how we are going to fight this problem. And a lot of you working in civil society, um, your problem, which you, which as Uma said, you handled very well this year by distributing food, by going to it. Our problem over the next few years is going to be tackling this enormous amount of chronic poverty that will come in, in addition to the chronic hunger that we have seen. So the last point was you talked to about us about the hate speeches, seven hundred percent, thousand percent. For us, it was a huge shock this year. For the first time, we in Telangana heard our leaders argue for us voting for them in councillor posts in Kukatpalli, saying that you should vote because Osama bin Laden will come to Hedra. That was the speeches we heard here. We, you should vote for us because you know there was this really comical thing. If it wasn't so sad, it was comical that in one Tappa Chabutra, one of the Rabirpura constituencies, um, Nanda, who's the president of the BJP, he is saying that, you know what Modi ji has done for you? You can all now go and buy land in Kashmir. Those fellows sitting there were the most hopeless, landless workers from Jharkhand. They were waiting for that biryani. And they were told that you can buy land in Kashmir and they said, Har -har -mod. you know, that's, that's, so we've seen it. And we've seen that, you know, from 4 to 49, it's a rude shock for us. So thanks for, for this book, sir. Thanks for sharing so much time with us, for really taking us through the message that I get in my 26th year of, of hearing Dr. Harsh Mandar very closely is a message that is beyond everything. It is a message of compassion. It is a message that says that, yes, all this will go on. There will be hatred, there will be violence. But it is the compassion that we share with each other. And for the poor and this sensitivity that will guide us. Uh, Harsh Mandar speaks about it. He writes about it. But most importantly, he does it every day at great cost to his life. Thank you all very much for having me. We will uh, we'll have a very basic lunch together that will give you some time to chat with the author and his wife and others and get your book signed. Thank you all very much.